Hi, welcome back. We are going to continue or finish chapter one today. Uh, I want to review with you the questions that you need to be answering for chapter one um, and what to do with that. So first of all, I want to remind you at the beginning of each video, we are reading the book Across Five Aprils written by Irene Hunt. And the questions come from the Lit Plan Teacher Pack uh, put together or published by Teachers Pet Publications and that was put together by Mary B. Collins. So the questions that we have, we looked at yesterday. I, hang on, share my screen. There it is, there they are. Um, yesterday we covered the answers for numbers one through six. I remind you that you need to restate the question when possible. Um, so for example, when you describe Ellen, you're not going to put the word describe, the verb that it's asking you to do, but you'll start with Ellen, and then you'll give a good description of her. Hopefully you recorded the pages and the information for that. Um, we really did a pretty good job yesterday finding the answers for numbers one through six. So if you struggled with them, please go back, rewatch the video, um, and find the information that you need. So today we're gonna to pick up reading where we left off and that will lead us into the answer to number seven, which is what happened to Jethro's sister, Mary. Uh, remember Jethro has lots of siblings. Um, and it's gonna be hard to keep track of all of them. Uh, question eight, to whom did Jethro compare his father and why? I think she have both parts of that. Nine, who was Nancy? We started to get an answer to that. I believe it was his brother John's wife, but we're going to get a little more information as well. Uh, identify Bill. So we're going to talk about who Bill is and then also identify Will's Graham. So most of these people are all family members. Uh, a lot of them are brothers and sisters. Some though are cousins. Um, and then we have that one oddball Shadrach Yale who is the schoolmaster and the school is actually on their property, Matt Crichton, who it doesn't ask us who Matt is, but we did learn that Ellen Jethro's mother is married to Matt Crichton, and uh, the schoolhouse is actually on their property, and Matt's in charge of that. So we're going to switch screens here. Oh, I thought I still had it open. You'll have to bear with me for just a minute. I closed out of Across Five Aprils while I was doing some other things, but here it is. I'm going to make this full screen so it's easier to see. If you have your book at home, I encourage you to follow along in your own book or you can follow along on the screen. You can see that in both ways. We are on page 12 and we, no, we are not. How did we go back a page? We are on page 14 because we had learned the name Copernicus and we read that furriner part. Um, we stopped right about here, about halfway down where we see she because we are switching from, they were joking around and having a good time and then all of a sudden it's gonna be talk about the Civil War again and Jethro didn't really wanna hear about it. So that's where we're going to pick up is on page 14, about halfway down. Here we go. She was back to the problems of the times, and Jethro knew that he could not tempt her away from them. For months, he had moved along the edge of the furor that raged among the adults of his family, of the neighborhood, and even of the church. He knew that there had been fights in the neighborhood, anger and triumph over the election of President Lincoln in the fall of 60, but he supposed, if he thought of it at all, this was the natural behavior of people interested in a vague thing called politics. He had heard talk of tariffs, of slave states and free ones, of a violent old man named John Brown, and during the past winter of states seceding from the Union. We talked about that yesterday. Remember, seceding means leaving. So they are separating from the Union. And we're in the United States of America. We're all one country. If they're seceding, seceding they're saying that they're not part of our country anymore. Lost my spot. Let's see where we are. Okay. But if it had just been talked to him and the only part of all that talk that held any interest for him was the conviction among all the men that war was sure to break out sooner or later. 
It hadn't broken out yet, however, and some men were swearing because the president had not declared war, while others were saying, just let old Abe fire on the South and watch Kentucky, Missouri, Tennessee, yes, and maybe Southern Illinois tumble over on the Confederate side of the fence. Now, Confederate, North or South? Confederate will be the South, the Union will be the North. So that'll be an important, some important facts to keep it straight for us too. He knew little about wars. The revolution, of course, the American Revolution, Shadrach had pointed out, and Jethro had been amazed that there was ever any other. He liked stories of wars. There was a beautiful one described in one of Shadrach's books in which an ancient king watched ships fight in a place called Salamis Bay. There was another exciting story of a battle in which small, fast ships with the lucky help of a violent storm had played old Ned with a proud and mighty navy. He wanted to tell his mother about that one, how if the battle had gone the other way, both Ellen and Jethro Crichton might well have been speaking Spanish as they planted their potatoes that April morning. She wouldn't have liked that, though. She was suspicious of people who spoke a different language. Well, one learned when to speak and when to keep one's tongue between his teeth. Jethro was not going to talk to his mother too much of either languages or wars, but he knew that as far as the latter were concerned, he was one with young Tom and Ebb when they hoped that war would come soon. War meant loud brass music and shining horses ridden by men wearing uniforms finer than any suit in the stores in Newton. It meant men riding like kings, looking neither to the right nor the left, while lesser men in perfect lines strode along with guns crossed their shoulders, their heads held high like horses with short reins. When the battle thundered and exploded on all sides, well, some men were killed, of course, but the stories of war that Jethro remembered were about the men who had managed to live through the thunder and explosion. Matt Crichton's grandfather had lived through the revolution. Matt himself had survived the Mexican War, and Uncle Billy Jeffers down the road was still alive to tell the tales of the War of 1812. Jethro, forgetting the lecture to his mother on the inclination of people to select beliefs that bring them most satisfaction, never doubted that if Tom and Ebb got their chance to go to war, they'd be back home when it was over, and that it would be shadowy men from distant parts who would die for the pages of future history books. Death, however, was neither simple nor lightly brushed. Aside, when it struck home, Jethro frowned. He didn't like to think of his sister Mary's death, so here we go. What happened to Jethro's sister's Mary? We already know from this that, that she has died, but there's a pretty big description in here of how she died and quite often it tends to confuse people. So I'm gonna read through it, and then I'm going to explain it a little bit for you before you do your answer. But some memory had been touched, off as his, his thoughts wandered. Let a few hours of work go by and let one's body begin to weary a little. Then the thoughts that had been all of beauty and spring a while before started turning to things that were better forgotten. He had not forgotten though. He'd been only seven that winter of 59, but the memory of the tragedy would always be sharp and terrible in his mind. Mary had been as pretty as Jenny, only blonde and more delicate. Jethro remembered that it was a bitter night and that he had stood with his nose pressed against the cold window pane watching Rob Nelson help her into the wagon before they left for a dance over toward Hidalgo. What happened later, he'd pieced together from loud outcries and scraps of conversation deep in the middle of the night. It seemed that a crowd of young toughs from the south of the county had broken uninvited into the dance, waving whiskey bottles and shouting drunken insults at the guests. As things began to look more and more dangerous, Rob found Mary's wraps and they were starting for home when a drunken youth named Travis Burdow, saw them leave and followed them on horseback. Rob told Matt Crichton how he had urged the team, hoping to get to Ed Turner's farm where he could get help because he knew that Burdow was armed. 
He's got his arm, or what does he have? He has a gun of some kind. Rob had succeeded in getting as far as Turner's driveway when Birdow, seeing that his game was about to be finished, rode up beside Rob's team and fired a pistol over the heads of the horses. The frightened animals bolted through a rail fence, overturning the wagon and kicking themselves loose from the tongue. Mary was dead when Rob and Ed Turner pulled her from the wreckage. So the misunderstanding a lot of times is we know that Travis Birdow and that name is gonna be pretty important as we continue on in the book, at least the Birdow name. Um, we know that he fired a shot. That shot did not hit Mary though. A lot of times we misunderstand and think that, that Mary was shot. It was just fired over their heads but what happened when the, to the horses when that fire was, that was shot in the air, it was a loud sound, the horses got scared and kind of freaked out while the wagon behind them then flipped over and that wagon flipped on top of Mary. And by the time they, they got to Mary, she was no longer alive. So it's, in, in essence, it does seem that Travis did kill her even though he didn't directly shoot her. So what happened to Mary? Um, you, I would like you to, to kind of recount the events, retell a little bit about what happened and then how she died. So that answer should be a couple sentences, please. We're gonna continue reading. The countryside was in an uproar the next day when news of the tragedy got around. Matthew Crichton was held in high esteem by his neighbors, and the senseless killing of his daughter stirred up a rage that was heightened by the fact that the whole Birdow family was commonly despised throughout the countryside as a shiftless lot with a bad background. The grandfather of Travis Birdow had come from somewhere farther downstate, and when he moved into Jasper County, he came hurriedly. In order, so the story went, to escape a mob of citizens whose anger during the years of petty thieving had exploded over the theft of a team of horses from a prosperous farmer. Whether the story was true or not, suspicion and dislike settled upon the family, and 30 years had failed to dissipate it. The Birdow children were nicknamed Jail Birdows by taunting schoolmates and persecuted in a hundred petty ways. Dave Birdow, father of young Travis and son of the alleged horse thief, was a sullen, silent man who shunned people in general and accepted their insults as a matter of course when he was forced to deal with them. His sons, for the most part, were much like him, except when liquor quickened their courage and defiance. The shot that Travis Birdow fired over Rob Nelson's team that night was a shot fired at a society that had kicked a boy from childhood on because he bore his grandfather's name. And so the anger of the mob at Mary's death was doubled and tripled because a bird owl was responsible. By late afternoon, a crowd of 50 or more armed men stopped at the Crichton cabin to tell Matt of their intention of hunting Travis Birdow down and hanging him on the spot. But Matt Crichton had intervened and it was a mark of the respect he commanded in the community that the men listened as he stood for an hour in the icy afternoon, pleading with them to keep their hands free of further bloodshed. Meaning he tells them not to go hang him. Do not commit a murder yourself. Jethro, understanding the situation more fully now that he was older, wondered at his father's intervention that afternoon. His own sympathies, even on a spring morning 18 months later, were with the angry men as they prepared for the manhunt. He wondered. He had great confidence in his father, but his sense of justice was hard put to it except the fact that Travis Birdow had been allowed to escape the consequences of his drunken crime. It occurred to him that he felt the same way toward his father as he did toward Abraham Lincoln. Who does he compare his father to? And, let's, and why? Why should the president waver so long? Why should he refuse week after week to start the great explosion which the young men wanted to get started and have finished before the year was well into the summer? 
Jethro had to admit to himself an uncomfortable feeling of anger for both the president and his father. They had not shown the hard, unyielding attitude that he admired in the talk of Tom and Eb and their friends. He sighed suddenly and deeply at his perplexities. Ellen noticed the sigh and glanced at him quickly. Be you spent, Jethro? Meaning, are you tired? He shook his head. No, I'm doing tolerable. I was just thinking about things. What kind of things, son? For one, I was wondering why Abe Lincoln can't make up his mind about war. I wonder, is he like Pa? Is he so against having blood on people's hands that he's afeard to start a war? So what does that mean? Is he afraid to start the war because of the bloodshed? That bloodshed would be on his hands. Ellen stopped her work and stood for a moment without speaking, her rough brown hands resting on the handle of the hoe. He's like a man standing where two roads meet, Jeff, she said finally. And one road is as dark and fearsome as the other. There ain't a choice between the two, and yet a choice has to be made. She shook her head. May the Lord help him, she whispered. May the Lord guide his hand. The sounds of mourning were all around them as they stood silently in the middle of the furrow. From the fields across the creek came the monotonous shout to the field horses. Up at the house, Jenny's voice came clearly, pleasant as the sound of a little bell ringing. Here, chick, she called. Here, chick, 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 chick. Ellen slowly reached out with her hoe and broke a clot of dirt into crumbling fragments. Well, we got planting to do, Jeff, she said at last and they went on with their work. When the sun was directly above their heads, Ellen leaned her hoe against the fence, and she and the boy trudged slowly up along the fence row toward the house. Hunger pains twisted Jethro's insides, and he was tired. But the prospect of dinner cheered, dinner and an hour of cool rest under the trees in the dooryard cheered him to the point where he could whistle a little and make lazy gestures of play with the shepherd dog that came bounding down the path to greet him. The cabin they approached was small and squat, built of logs and entirely plain, a typical pioneer's cabin. Its basic ugliness was softened by a thick growth of vines clamoring over the walls and roof and by a general air of neatness and pleasant dignity in the dooryard. The hedgerow of lilacs and the prim green rows of vegetables in the garden, two rooms of the cabin faced west, dozen Dozen split bottom chairs were, ra were ranged for the comfort of those who wished to rest and get a breath of air after meals, or to sit in the coolness of a spring night and watch the shadows move in over the prairies. Behind these rooms, a kitchen extended the width of the house, with the doors at either end opening onto the dooryard. Here, huge silver poplars towered above the cabin, their roots extending like giant claws, making the ground rough and robbing it of grass. A low picket fence covered the, with a tangle of sweet honeysuckle stretched along the front of the yard. Beyond this fence were the hitching posts in an area covered by sweet clover and an acrid smelling little flower that Jethro knew as dog fennel. The road in front of the house ran due north through that line where the last glacier had melted in some distant age and left its final load of drift, a line that separated the rich black loam culture of Northern Illinois from the poor hard packed clay culture to the South. Jethro regretted, regretted the melting of that glacier. If it could have hung on another hundred miles, life might have been very different for him and his family, but then it hadn't. And anyway, he loved the dog fennel and the silver poplars and the hedge of lilacs on the South that separated Jenny's well-drained kitchen garden from the dooryard. He doubted that there were such wooden hills or winding creeks in the corn belt of the north as one could find by the dozens in the clay hands, and he could not imagine contentment in any other spot other than this one, which his father had chosen 30 years before. But it was a pity about the glacier. Only another hundred miles. Jenny had poured fresh water into a big basin so that her mother and Jethro could cool their faces and wash the dirt and grime from their hands. Nancy and the little tykes are here, she called to Ellen. We got a nice meal fixed for you. I'm just wondering, is that the next question? 
Yep, who is Nancy? Let's see if it tells us a little more clearly. Jenny had swept her shining black hair high up upon her head because of the heat in the kitchen where the food was prepared over an open fireplace and little drops of sweat stood out under her eyes and over a very firm chin. She grinned at Jethro and whacked him briskly on the seat as he came up to the kitchen well. I've got a crock of lettuce for you, Jeth, though I'm terrible wasteful and picking it too young. But I know how you've been dreaming green things as far back as last December. Nancy and I allowed maybe your body had need of spring eating. Green food. The hunger pangs grew even sharper at her words. His body did indeed have need of green food. It, if a continuous hunger for it meant that a need existed. He had felt many times during the long winter that he would have gladly exchanged all the pork in the smokehouse and all the gallons of sorghum, which he had helped to boil down for one big crock of salad greens. He smiled at her and Jenny understood his gratitude. It was as much as she expected. The Crichton males did not go into long speeches about such matters. John's wife looked up from her work and smiled shyly at Jethro and her mother-in-law when they entered the kitchen. So John's wife, we saw earlier, is Nancy. So one thing we do learn about her here is that she is shy. I invited myself up for the day, Miss Crichton, she said in her thin voice. The name Miss Crichton was not a joke when Nancy used it. There was a reserve about the thin, quiet girl John had brought back from Kansas four years before that kept her almost a stranger to her husband's family. She was amiable, but aloof. So amiable is friendly. Aloof is kind of standoffish. <laughs> so she's friendly, but she doesn't share too much. To the friendly Crichtons, except for an occasional gesture of fondness for Jenny and for John's favorite brother, Bill. So Bill, is that the next one? Identify Bill. So John, Bill would be John's favorite brother. Would Bill also be Jethro's brother? Yes, lots of brothers. <laughs> John defended his wife earnestly to his mother. So within this paragraph, we have several different descriptions about Nancy. Please make sure that when you identify Nancy that you give me more than just she's John's wife. Describe what she is like as well. Give me a second sentence. And then as we get into Bill, we're going to look for a little more detail about him besides just the fact that he is Jethro's brother and John's favorite. So here's the defense of Nancy, though. She was brought up by relations that treated her harsh. To draw back and say nothing is her way of protecting herself. You must be patient with her, Ma, like one of your own. Ellen had had long schooling and patience. Now as she answered Nancy's greeting, her voice was very quiet. You never need every invitation to John's home, Nancy. It's yourn too, and you'll have welcome any day. She seated herself beside the door and took the youngest child in her lap. Nancy went on with her work, not sullenly, but so withdrawn that Ellen wearily gave up trying to talk with her and directed all her attention to the smallest boy. The men came in from the field soon. Jethro, because he was now a field worker, was allowed to eat at the first table with his parents and an elder and elder brothers. It was a convert a coveted honor and he accepted it with dignity, looking somewhat like a solemn dwarf as he sat between his father and Bill, his eyes wide beneath the tumble of yellow curls that clung to his forehead and the back of his neck. Across from him were the 18 year olds. Tom was a mild faced lad who, like Jethro and Bill, had inherited the blonde hair and blue eyes of his father, side of the family. Ab Karen, a nephew of Matt's, had lived with the Crichtons since he had been orphaned in childhood. So Tom and Eb were mentioned earlier. Tom's 18 and is uh, Jethro's brother. Eb is also 18, but is Jethro's cousin. Jethro admired the two big boys, but he sensed their indifference toward him and kept his distance generally. He was not especially hurt by their attitude. The youngest in the family knew his place. Besides, Jenny and Bill made up for any neglect on the part of the big boys a hundred times or more. Bill, 
his favorite. So here's our description. There's lots of details in this paragraph. Please give me lots of details. Was a big silent man who was considered peculiar in the neighborhood. In an environment where reading was not regarded highly, there was something suspect about a young man who not only cared very little for hunting or wrestling and nothing at all for drinking and rampaging about the country, but who read every book he could lay his hands upon as if he prized a printed page more than the people around him. He wasn't quite held in contempt for he had great physical strength and was a hard worker, two attributes admired by the people around him, but he was odd. And there was no doubt of that. Men had seen him stop his team in midfield to watch the flight of a line of birds. And a story went the rounds of Bill talking to his horse as if it was a person, were a person. He talked to it gentle, the story went, like a woman talking to a youngin. He had even attended school the previous winter when work was slack, which was surely a fool thing to do unless one was interested in breaking up school. He had listened intently to what a young man three years his junior had to say. He had studied and done the tasks set for him by Shadrach Yale as if he were no older than Jethro. It was not a behavior pattern of which the backwoods country community approved. A lot of people smirked a little when they mentioned Bill Crichton. Jethro loved Bill far and away beyond his other brothers. His mother understood why. He put his hand in the fire for you, Jeff, she told him once, and Jethro believed her. John, the oldest of the children, left at the home place, sat at the end of the table facing his mother. He was dark like Ellen and more slender and wiry than Bill. These two brothers were very close to one another, a fact which had always been a matter of pride to Ellen, who strove to make family ties firm and secure. John was more impatient, quicker to anger than Bill, but the two of them had sought each other's companionship from childhood. There seemed to be a bond of understanding between them that developed with the years. John's oldest son was named for his brother, and Nancy, whose aloofness toward Ellen and Matt never once gave way in the face of all their efforts, addressed John's favorite as Brother Bill. Jethro neither liked nor disliked John, Perhaps because of Nancy's shyness, which he interpreted as unfriendliness, the boy extended his feeling of the uneasiness with her to John and the two children. He seldom went near his brother's cabin, which was only a half mile away, and he made no move to attract or amuse the children. Jenny moved quickly and a little breathlessly from fireplace to table, carrying dishes of meat and roasted potatoes, pitchers of milk and great mounds of cornbread squares, still powdered with the wood ashes in which they had been baked. She was red-cheeked with pride over her efforts in providing a good dinner, and her eyes flashed a little in the direction of Tom and Ed, from whom she anticipated the usual teasing. Jethro smiled at her when she brought on the huge crock of lettuce, and Jenny saw to it that he received a generous serving before she passed it around the table. Nancy poured steaming coffee into big mugs, and Jenny placed one beside the plate of each adult at the table. Children might have priority to a pudding or the last piece of cake, but coffee was an adult luxury, which Jethro enjoyed, but dismissed as a passive acceptance of family custom that he never thought to question. On this day of the boys' graduation to first table honors, however, Bill took a dried crust of bread, the remains of a rarely served white loaf, and after soaking it in his coffee cup for a few seconds, spread it with butter and placed it on his brother's plate. Jethro nodded his thanks briefly. He did not wish to attract the attention of the others at the table, to the favor. This meal is right good, Jenny, John remarked pleasantly. You are a fair cook for your years. We might have had cake and fixins though if Shad had been eaten with us, Tom said, grinning at his sister who could hardly hold back the pleased smile that mention of the young schoolmaster elicited. Can't help but feel a mite sorry for poor Shad, Ab Adam so added solemnly. Jenny's been feeding him so nicely, nice lately, he won't be able to say no, comes a leap year. Jenny is far and away too young to be thinking about Shad or any other young man. 
her father remarked quietly. Jenny looked to the ceiling for an exasperated second, and as she stood behind her father's chair, she was only 14, it was true, but she was as tall as Nancy and within two years as old as Ellen had been when she married Matthew Crichton. It was also true that she had her eye on Shadrach Yale, and all had been going well too, until recently when, after a private talk with her father, the young schoolmaster had taken on a solemnly, solemn and paternal attitude toward her, which Jenny found intensely annoying and unsatisfactorily. Wonder when she had allowed us to get back, John asked after a guarded smile had been shared by the young people. By nine or thereabouts, he thought, Ellen answered. I hope we won't be too far spent to wait up for him. I won't, John said and I want to see them city newspapers. He stopped as he saw Nancy's anxious eye on his face. He had tried to avoid talk of war as much as possible lately. He had tried. The two younger boys were too eager for it, the women folk too ready to cry about it, and Bill, for the first time that John could remember, had reservations about a subject and seemed unwilling to discuss it with his brother. They ate in silence after that, but there was a tension in the air. Jethro, although he was concerned mostly with the goodness of the food he ate, was vaguely aware of the troubled preoccupation all about him. He and his mother went back to the fields after they had rested for an hour or so. The afternoon was hot, and the new freckles across Jethro's shoulders were nearly lost by mid-afternoon beneath the red burn that spread over them. Ellen untied her apron and folded it across the back of his neck. That helped a little until the throngs of the potato pouch rubbed a blister on the sunburned skin. Sorry. After which sweat and insects joined forces to torment him. The buoyancy of spirit and the beauty of early mornings had long since given away to discomfort and the boredom of monotony. By sundown, both Ellen and Jethro dragged down the length of the field with weariness lining their faces and tugging at their bodies. Seems like a lot of taters, Miss Crichton, Jethro said finally. He tried to smile, but the dark circles around his eyes were more convincing than his smile. At the end of the furrow, Ellen sat down on the grass near the rail fence and reached a hand out to the boy. We'll set a minute, Jeff. Sun up to sundown is a long time for either boy or woman. The plantain won't suffer over much if we spell ourselves a little. He was grateful for the rest. And clasping his knees, he let his head fall forward. While comfort poured all through him with the relaxation of his body, he teased an ant that tried to run across the stick at his feet. Blocking its way with his big toe of one foot and then the other, chuckling a little at his own mischief. Shadows were beginning to grow long among the trees on Walnut Hill, and down along the creek where the dogwood branches stood out whiter and more like ghostly clouds with the background of misty purple thickening behind them. Jethro let the ant go on its way and sat staring at the shadows with the lonely ache that beauty sometimes brought to him. He turned once to speak to his mother, but she sat silently, her large eyes closed, as she rested her head against one of the gray rails. So he said nothing, glad to prolong their rest for as long as possible. They had sat for 10 minutes or more when the sound of wheels far down the road attracted their attention. Ellen rose stiffly and leaned against the rails. Jethro stood beside her. It's too early for Shed to be getting back from Newton, Ellen said, rubbing her eyes. Can you make out whose team it is, Jeff? Team, that's the horses. Not anybody from right around here, he answered. Sure is a fine high step in team, though. They watched curiously as the wagon approached, the team obviously being checked as the driver saw Ellen and Jethro beside the fence. Then the wagon came to a stop. Beside them, a young man rose from the seat and swept off his hat. Ain't you folks up in up here in Illinois, a mite behind with your crops this year, Aunt Ellen, he called with a, his voice suggesting laughter. Ellen's face broke into a wide smile of recognition. Well, 
in the name of all that's good, we'll scram whatever brings you up from Kentuck at this time of year. She climbed over the low rails and held out her arms to the young man who had jumped down from the wagon. I had some dealing in these parts, Aunt Ellen. I figured it was worth an extra day of driving to see all of you. Think you can put me and my team up for the night? Jethro could see the pleasure in his mother's face. This cousin, Wills Graham, was her sister's son. His visit would mean news of the Kentucky country where Ellen had been born and the relatives from whom she so seldom heard. As for Jethro, delight ran up his spine. He did not know Will Scram, but the man was company. That meant enough to set his day apart from the monotonous routine of many others. So the last question you have there is identify Will Scram. So we know that um, he calls Ellen and Ellen, and they also mentioned that he is a cousin. So as we wrap up lesson one, I do want to remind you that um, you're going to write complete sentences to answer all of those. When you submit chapter one, I'd like you to have all 11 questions together. Please submit those to Schoology for me, whether typed or a picture of what you hand wrote. If you can't do that, then please take a picture and send it to Remind. There is one other assignment. Um, if you look on the flash drive or on Schoology, there'll be an article there about Fort Sumter. And I would like you to make sure that you read that article before reading or doing the lesson on chapter two, which will actually be lesson three. All right, have a great day. See you later.